Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Lyme disease or Lyme borreliosis. This is the most common tick-borne illness in the United States, with on average about 30,000 cases reported each year. But there are probably about 300,000 actual cases. It's caused by bacteria. Bacteria is Borrelia burgdorferi here in the United States, in Europe, in Asia. It's called Borrelia afzeli and Borrelia garini. The incidence varies from year to year depending on meteorologic conditions and temperature and rainfall and humidity and the prevalence of the reservoir host. The first clinical description was in 1977, a rheumatologist practicing in Lyme, Connecticut, hence the name, had an outbreak on his hands of what he thought initially was juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, affected 39 children and 12 adults. The individuals had a red annular rash, and then it progressed after a while to asymmetric swelling of the large joints. After careful review of the medical literature, he found similar cases from several decades previously in Europe after the bite of a tick. So he thought it was probably a bacterial infection, but it wasn't until 1982 when a microbiologist, Dr. Willy Bergdorfer, was able to discover the bacteria that now bears his name, discovered them in a tick. So the disease tends to begin at the site of the tick bite with a solitary rash that expands. It's called erythema migrans. And then the bacteria disseminate. Sometimes they cause smaller skin eruptions that look like the original, but oftentimes they cause neurologic manifestations. And then after some time, after maybe weeks or months or years, it attacks the joints, typically attacks the knee and causes an arthritis. But while the disease tends to occur sequentially, going from one stage to another, you could skip a stage or you could have a couple stages present at the same time, and even untreated, it seems that the body's immune system ultimately is able to triumph and get rid of the organism. And most of the symptoms, or all of the symptoms, completely disappear. Now there's a question about, is there such a thing as chronic Lyme disease? People argue about that. Probably the answer is no. Well, there's Lyme borreliosis, the Lyme organism, the borrelia itself, it exists in at least 20 different genotypes. We put them all into one category. We call it Borrelia burgdorferi sensu lato. And it's important that we realize that not all of the organisms are exactly the same. So in the United States, Borrelia burgdorferi tends to cause an arthritis. Borrelia afzeli in Europe tends to cause thinning of the skin and pressure on a nerve, while Borrelia garini, that tends to affect the nervous system relatively early. In the United States, we have a bimodal onset where it affects children between the ages of 5 and 15 and adults between the ages of 45 and 55. In adults, it's more common in men than women who are less than age 60, but over age 60, it seems that the sex incidence equalizes in the United States seems that 90% of the cases go from Maine down to Virginia and North Carolina, with some in Wisconsin and Michigan and Minnesota, slight extension into southern Canada, and about 10% of the cases may occur in northern California and southern Oregon. Well, those people most likely to be affected, obviously, are people who are going to be around ticks, so that means with outdoor activities, so hikers and forestry workers and gardeners and campers and hunters. Those are the people who seem to be most likely to come in contact with the tick. Now the tick has three different stages. It has the larval stage, the nymphal stage, the adult stage. Each of them requires a blood meal. The larval stage and the nymphal stage, they feed on the same animal. It's mostly the white-footed mouse, occasionally a chipmunk or a bird. Those animals are infected but asymptomatic. On the other hand, the adult tick feeds on the white-tailed deer. The white-tailed deer, not involved in life cycle, of the spirochete, but the deer are essential in the overall transmission of the ticks. The tick is known as Ioxides scapularis. It's also present in the southeastern and south central United States, but it doesn't transmit the disease. Why? Well, because it feeds on lizards, not the rodents and the lizards aren't susceptible to the infection. Now, 
with transmission. The transmission is from the tick bite. It's not from a blood transfusion or sex or semen or urine or breast milk. Iscapularis, also known as the deer tick or the black-legged tick or the beer tick, has a two-year life cycle. The adult drinks blood over a period of about four to five days. Now, there are different kinds of ticks. So in the northeastern United States, it's that I scapularis. But in the California region, it's I pacificus. And there are different kinds of ticks in Europe. The adult tick, as I said, prefers to bite the white-tailed deer. Humans are dead-end hosts. It doesn't like to bite humans. So most of the disease comes from the nymphal form. The tick attaches to the human then it puts its salivary proteins into the skin that can transmit the infection. The blood meal takes 24, 48 hours. There's no infection over the first short while. The adult stage feeds more slowly than the nymphal stages. Borrelia burgdorferi is a spirochete. It's related to the organism that causes syphilis and leptospirosis. It's what we call a gram-negative organism. It has a small genome with high variability. And it seems that the variability of the genospecies, or the genetic material, seems to be related to the outcome. Now, the organism has no virulence factors. It doesn't have any toxins. It doesn't have any extracellular membrane that degrade protein. It seems that the disease relates to the body's immune reaction to the organism. The organism is an obligate parasite. It requires the host for support. It can't live by itself. Most of the spread occurs during the time when the nymphal ticks bite in the late spring and in the summertime. And ultimately, as I said, the body's innate immune system and adaptive immune system is going to be able to triumph and completely, for the most part, get rid of all manifestations of the disease. Now, clinically, the disease typically begins in late spring or the summer. Stage one is that erythema migraines at the site of the bite. 75% of people who are affected are going to develop the rash within the first 30 days, typically within the first week or two. Only 15, 20, 30 percent of the people are going to recall being bitten by a tick. Typically, it's going to occur on the groin or in the back or in the waist or on the legs or in the back or in the axilla and children in the head and neck. Typically, the rash begins as a solitary bump, relatively quickly spreads outward over several days to weeks. Then it spontaneously resolves in about a month or so. Most people talk about it as being a bullseye-like configuration, but two-thirds of the cases are uniformly red, or maybe with a little central red enhancement. It can be slightly itchy, but it's not warm and it's not tender. It tends to grow to about five to seven inches, but could be as large as two feet in diameter. It may be associated with some symptoms. So some people develop some fatigue or malaise or headache or arthralgias or myalgias or a little fever, maybe swelling of the nodes. But that's not necessarily typical. At stage one, this erythema migraines causes an infiltration into the skin of a variety of white blood cells. And that causes the immune system to be activated. And the neutrophils, a type of white blood cell, that are usually quite handy in killing the organism for some reason, because of the organism's presence and what the organism does, it inactivates those neutrophils so the bacteria can spread. And there's some dissemination in the bloodstream. And there's more recruitment of inflammatory cells. And the process goes on until the body finally is able to triumph or a person gets some antibiotics. Then after a while, we get into stage two, the early disseminated form. And this occurs days to weeks after the initial bite. Person, again, might not have been aware of the bite, might not even have been aware of the rash, or the rash might not even have occurred. But then the secondary manifestation can be smaller skin eruptions that look sort of like the first, but miniature, or can be involving some extracutaneous sites. Well, the important sites in the secondary infection, or the secondary manifestations, or the central or the peripheral nervous system, and sometimes the hearts, and sometimes the joints. So Lyme borreliosis, or Lyme neuroborreliosis, occurs in fewer than 20% of the people, fewer than 20% of the people 
who are infected but not treated. They get neurologic abnormalities within weeks to months. Sometimes the symptoms wax and wane for a while. Symptoms can involve the cranial nerves, can cause meningitis, can cause neuropathy, either the motor neuropathy and affect the movement or can cause a sensory neuropathy cause some peculiarities of sensation. Less frequently, there's an encephalitis or a myelitis or the cerebellum can be uh, affected. Sometimes multiple nerves are affected. The most frequently affected nerve is the seventh cranial nerve. That causes Bell's palsy. And sometimes it could be bilateral. Usually it's unilateral, one-sided. And sometimes people develop a lymphocytic meningitis with periodic headache and stiff neck. And sometimes people can develop systemic symptoms. So they can develop some fever or chills or malaise or dizziness or aches and pains in different parts of the body. Sometimes a little rash on the face or conjunctivitis less common manifestations of stage two disease, sometimes a sore throat, little elevation of the liver enzyme, sometimes little anemia or protein in the urine. Children can develop some headache and visual loss and increase in pressure within the central nervous system. The definition of Lyme borreliosis requires some objective neurologic deficit so some of the symptoms that I just mentioned, and then a spinal tap that shows some white blood cells in the spinal fluid, and then some antibodies that are produced inside the central nervous system. And even without antibiotic therapy, the symptoms of Lyme disease affecting the nervous system tend to go away. There's another manifestation of stage two disease, has to do with cardiac involvement. Again, fluctuating in intensity. It's involvement of the conducting system of the heart. Well, that's important because it can slow the heart rate quite dramatically. Less frequently, it causes a myocarditis or abnormality of left ventricular function or causes enlargement of the heart or valve involvement. But most of the time, it causes a conduction disorder. And a conduction disorder occurs within days or months after the infection, usually about two to five weeks after the erythema migraine, sometime a person has what we call first degree, second degree, or third degree block. Well, that's important because it can vary between day to day or hour to hour, but it can slow the heart rate and sometimes require temporary pacemaker, but given enough time, usually within one to six weeks, all the manifestations seem to disappear. Then comes stage three. Stage three, in 60% of people who are untreated, it's going to be a type of arthritis that occurs on average about six months after the infection, but could vary between four days and two years. Typically, it affects a large joint, typically the knee, but sometimes the small joints. Typically, it's one joint at a time, but sometimes it's several joints. Sometimes there are intermittent attacks. The joint can become swollen and painful and red. Sometimes it can persist, and a person, even after treatment, can have some symptoms that may persist for several years. Now, interestingly, in the northeastern United States, Lyme disease is associated untreated with about 50% involvement of the joints, but in California and Oregon, only about 5% of the people are going to have some sort of joint involvement. Sometimes when we get the arthritis stage, we can have involvement of the tendons and the bursa, sometimes prolonged arthritis usually disappears with the oral or the intravenous antibiotics, but some cases the synovial inflammation can persist, and that's generally because of a problem where the immune system can't be turned off. Once it starts to attack, it continues to attack. Maybe there are some antigens present from the dead organisms that are present or that remain. Well, how do we diagnose the condition? We could culture the bacteria. That's not likely to occur. It's a very difficult organism to deal with. Sometimes we do polymerase chain reaction, that PCR that you heard about, but that's mostly for a research setting. Typically what we do is we do some antibody tests. We do an ELISA test. And if it's positive or equivocal, we do a Western blot test. But in the summer of 2019, the 
group responsible for making up the rules said, now nah, you can do a second ELISA test, a different kind of ELISA test, because the Western blot that we typically do is really a hard test to deal with and it has some inaccuracies. So the serologic diagnosis is important. So in the first several weeks after infection, it's not positive. You don't have any antibodies. And then you develop some IgM antibodies in about 20 to 50 percent of the people in early infection, but it isn't until about four to eight weeks later that 100 percent of the people have positive antibodies. And as far as the central nervous system is concerned, well, if a person has meningitis or has other kind of central nervous system problems, some antibodies are going to be manufactured in the central nervous system, but what we're going to do is we're going to do a spinal tap and find that it has white blood cells, increased protein, has normal glucose, so overall, we can do some blood tests or test the cerebrospinal fluid if there's indication. But interestingly, there are more than 3 million tests that are ordered for Lyme disease every year in the United States. And even if the test is 99% specific, that means that there are going to be tens of thousands of false positive tests. So we don't want to do the test unless there's a probability that the person's infected. So if we have a person in Nebraska who has some of the manifestations, let's not do the test because if we do the test, we're going to find that if it's positive, it's going to lead us on a wild goose chase. Now, there's another problem. And the problem is that if you're infected and treated, the antibodies are only going to very slowly disappear. And that means that some later date, maybe the following year, or two years later, you have some similar symptoms, do the test again, the test is positive. Is the test positive because it's lingered from the first infection? Or is this just sort of a red herring and you're not infected currently, but this is just the remains? So that's an issue. Well, another issue is that the ticks can be co-infected with different organisms. So the tick could be infected with anaplasma phagocytophyllum that causes a particular kind of condition where your white blood count goes down, your platelets go down, you get a fever and a headache and muscle pains and aches and chills. There are other conditions that may be passed on by the tick at the same time. And as a matter of fact, in New Jersey, 50% of the ticks are infected with at least one organism. What's the prevention? Prevention is, well, the tick is going to require attachment for more than a couple hours in order to spread the disease. So if you check your skin every couple hours or you take a bath when you come home, chances are that's going to be pretty good evidence. Tick repellent, sure. More than 20% DEET seems to work pretty well. Protective clothing, especially clothing with permethrin seems to work pretty well. You tuck your pants into your socks. When you get home, you take your clothes off and put them into a dryer on high for at least six minutes. That's going to kill the tick. Wash them in hot water. That's going to kill the tick. Check your skin for the presence of the tick because remember, it takes multiples of hours in order for the disease to be spread. Frequency of infection after just one tick bite only one to four percent, even if you're in an area where there's a lot of the disease. Typically, the tick needs to be attached for more than 36 hours in Europe, perhaps less. Question is, if you're bitten by a tick, should you take a dose of doxycycline within 72 hours of the bite? It can prevent the disease in most people, but it's not routinely recommended. We'd have to treat at least 50 people in order to prevent one infection. And if you get the tick off soon enough, then that's not typically an issue. Well, treatment, if you have the erythema migrans form, the skin eruption, seems doxycycline or amoxicillin for 10 to 14 days, that's pretty good. There's some resistance to the azithromycin and erythromycin, so if you can't take the doxycycline or the amoxicillin, probably ceftin is a good bet, sometimes azithromycin. Well, we have some problems, of course, in pregnant women and in children. The treatment shortens the course of the skin eruption and prevents the later manifestations of the disease, so that's a good idea. If you have the neurologic disease, you have the meningitis, often begin with some parenteral intramuscular therapy, ceftriaxone, finish off with uh, up to a 14-day course of doxycycline, or sometimes just use doxycycline by itself. 
if you have cranial nerve palsy, the therapy won't make the palsy improve, but it'll prevent furtherance of the disease. So that's a good idea. But once the damage is done, then it just takes some time typically to heal. If you have encephalitis, which is relatively unusual, then we use intravenous ceftriaxone. Doxycycline orally actually is pretty promising. If you have the carditis, you might need a pacemaker but the antibiotics and time typically are sufficient. Now, sometimes when you get the antibiotic and all of the spirochetes dissolve at once, you could have an allergic reaction to that. You could have what we know as a jarish hirschheimer reaction. Typically, we see that in syphilis when we treat that. About 15% of the people. It tends to occur within 24 hours, worsening of the fever and the muscle aches and the arthritis. It tends to go away within a day. The treatment for Lyme arthritis, well, it's a 28-day course of oral antibiotics. For the overwhelming majority of people, sometimes parenteral antibiotics are used. Sometimes people cut it down to 14 days. Standard is 28 days at the present time. We don't use any intraarticular steroids before or during the antibiotic therapy, but you can take some non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, naproxen or, uh, or ibuprofen, drugs like that. There's a question about after the arthritis goes away, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the people might have some persistent symptoms. And the question is, are the persi persistent symptoms due to the Lyme disease or is it due to, most likely, the chronic inflammatory response? Most likely it's a chronic inflammatory response. So it goes away with an injection of steroids into the joint or maybe some methotrexate or some other kind of therapy that can quiet the synovial reaction down within a period of six months or thereabout. And it seems that if you do develop Lyme arthritis at the knee, it might predispose later on to development of osteoarthritis and you get no immunity from reinfection. Now this post-treatment symptom. So some people complain of fatigue and cognitive difficulties and musculoskeletal pain. People refer to that as the post-treatment Lyme disease or chronic Lyme disease or post-Lyme disease. It's an in vogue condition, nonspecific symptoms. Yes, indeed, we're going to find that you have the antibodies for the most part if you've had the disease, but a lot of people don't even have them. We have a lot of self-proclaimed experts saying you need some antibiotics, you should take a sulfur, you should take pulsed antibiotics, you should take long courses of antibiotics, you should take metronidazole or diflucan, or you should go and get some chelation therapy. But we don't have any good evidence that any of that makes any sense. It's all pretty much nonsense. But there are indeed some people who do have chronic symptoms. But interestingly, when we look at the people with chronic symptoms, and we just take a look at people in general in society, we find that there's a lower incidence of those symptoms in people who had Lyme disease than in the general population. So we think now that those people who persist with their symptoms for long periods of time, well maybe they're suffering from depression or fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome and maybe they'd be better off with some cognitive behavioral therapy or acupuncture, massage, maybe even an antidepressant pill. Some of those might be more important remedies. Now, there was a vaccine for a short while that was marketed between 1998 and 2002. It was about 80% effective, but for some reason, the advocacy groups really opposed the vaccine, and it was taken off the market. So in summary, we have Lyme disease. It's caused by a Borrelia. That's a spirochete, Borrelia burgdorferi, here in the United States. Tick-borne illness, Ioxides scapularis. The nymphal stage bites the human. The reservoir is the white-footed mouse treated by doxycycline or amoxicycline. Goes through different stages. Stage one with the erythema migrans. Stage two with the neuroborreliosis, sometimes cardiac disease. Then stage three is the Lyme disease, Lyme arthritis. You can skip a stage. Multiple stages can be present at the same time. So there you have it. That's Lyme disease. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend and subscribe so that you'll be warned of the new shows as we put them up. We appreciate your time. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.